Well, thank you very much. It is uh, it's great to be here. Um, I was a teacher for many years and uh, now run a charity called I Can and I Am, speaking to hundreds, speaking at hundreds of schools, um, to parents, to pupils, and to staff members. And what I would love to do this afternoon is share with you my story, my journey over the last seven years, the world of education today, and how we can support, or how we do with the charity of I Can and I Am, try to support young people in what is quite a challenging world. So I'm married, we have four children, and uh, like I said, I taught for a number of years, and in 2012, I applied for my first headship. And a surprise to me, I think a surprise to many people, I got that job. And that was very exciting, all was good. It was my career was on its way, we were gonna move into a beautiful home, and all was good. I was then invited to go for a medical. And medicals, if I'm honest with you, I kind of associated with sporting superstardom. I thought, wow, am I one of those now? So off I bounced to the school doctor, and um, as a result of a series of tests, that was where I was diagnosed with the life-changing brain tumor. And I will never forget returning home. It still really moves me as I share this story, returning home and sharing that reality with our four children. And my eldest son, who's now 17, who was then 10, looking at me with his little chin wobbling as he tried to hold back the tears, as I told him that Daddy's got a brain tumor, he just looked at me and said, Daddy, are you going to die? That was a fastball. That was a really fastball. And I remember saying to him, I don't know, my boy, but I'm going to fight. And a fight it has been. Actually, in many respects, a fight it still is. 27 hours of brain surgery followed. I spent 80 days in hospital, during which time I had a, a tracheostomy, which meant that I couldn't eat or drink or talk, which actually I've since realized are three of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> um, but the biggest challenge came as a result of my second surgery. And as I stand here this afternoon, I'm a registered blind person with no sight in my left eye and about 10% vision in my right eye. That's tough. Um, and as a result of that, that meant that I um, had to hand in or let go of the dream job, which may well have been a nightmare, but I don't know. Um, and not wanting your pity, folks, if I compare 2012 with 2013, they couldn't be more starkly different. 2012, the job, the career, the house, everything set fair was, was going well. Yet in 2013, with a wife, with four children, I found myself with no job, with no house, and very little sight. And actually, many of the challenges rumble on today. I'm not able to drive a car now, so I spend a lot of time on trains. And it wasn't that long ago where I got onto a very busy carriage of a train, and I sat down directly on a man's sandwich. <laughs> Literally sort of crushing these sandwiches into a sort of pancakes. <laughs> and this man shouted out, and I absolutely just not, shouted out for the whole carriage, said, are you effing blind? And I held out my white cane, which is just down there, and I said, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> And the whole carriage, just like this, sort of thought, this is hilariously funny. You must come more often. Um, so I then found myself in September 2013, back in that place of no job. We had bought a house, and we were sort of squeezed in there. And that was the time of really trying to sort of reevaluate what, what is going on? What is the next step? And I remember a great friend, um, a man called Simon Walker, used to come and see me. And he would always ask me the same question, a brilliant question. He would say, James, what is your passion? And to begin with, all I could really iterate, I just want to be normal again. I can't sort of walk properly. I can't really talk. I can't pour a cup of tea without pouring all the water over the sideboard. I couldn't do those basic things. Gradually, those competencies started to return. And by about December... He was then able to say to me, James, what is your passion? Same question. And I was then able to say that my passion is to see young people believing in who they are and what they can do. You see, folks, sometimes I see the journey of education a little bit like a funnel, very linear. 
And we start off at the top of the funnel where it's wide, and education is gloriously, it's fun, it's, it's full of curiosity, it's an adventure, those sort of words you would attach to it. But quite quickly, it narrows down. And that's where words like pretest and assessment and exam performance begin to really come to the fore. And that's really tough. And what really grieves me is this is where there's almost a stratification of those that can do it, the fast lane, the good guys, the, the clever ones. And then there's the gang who can't really do it. And that's really tough. That's really tough. So there's an academic pressure resting on one shoulder. But the other shoulder, what is so different in today's world, is the way that young people relate. The time-honored traits and, uh, of kindness, of loyalty, of faithfulness, what it means to be a good friend, somehow has been thrown to the breeze. And the way they relate today is almost entirely upon the platform of, of social media. Social media, which is highly addictive, as we know, but it also requires them to be available day and night, 24-7. And my real issue is that they relate to each other at a skin-deep level, where often it's the me, me, me culture that is propagated. So there it is, really. There are two big pressures on young people today. The academic pressure on one shoulder and the social media on the other shoulder. And what's that leading to? Well, as we all know, we are now facing so many more young people battling with that sense of self-belief, battling with that sense of anxiety, and that's where depression and suicide are increasingly a reality. So, folks, I don't want to stand here like a sort of blind bull doom monger, but I want to say to you that I really do believe that there is a way through and what I'd like you to do is to look at my balloon. I want you to imagine that each and every young person that you know has a balloon within them. And we want their balloons inflated with a sense of I can and I am. As opposed to that rather lamentable scene of... Excuse, excuse me. Can't and no good. And that's what many people are leaving school with, that sense of, I can't. I don't know who I am. I'm no good. You see, I sometimes liken that rather deflated image to a car tire. And if you go home this evening, you get into your car, and your front left tire is deflated. It's got no air in it. You hit a curb. You drive through one or two potholes. That's the point at which the rim of the wheel starts to get damaged. And in the same way, if we go through the journey of life and we've got no air in our balloons, we fail a test, we, we get dropped from the team, nobody's following us on Instagram, we put up a vulnerable video, nobody's liking it. That's the point at which it's not the rim of the wheel, it's us. It's our sense of self, it's our psyche, it's who we are that is getting damaged. So, folks, it's a very simple question that I want to pose to you this afternoon. And that is, how do we inflate their balloons? How do we inflate them? And, folks, this is where I come up with my four pillars. And the first is the centrality of, and the importance of the word belonging. Belonging is a foundational, fundamental human need. We need to belong. And so do they to their teams, to their youth clubs, to their communities, to their families. They need to be accepted. Schools need to be places that celebrate diversity, that don't homogenize people into a, they're the gang that cope and you're the gang that doesn't really cope. As well as that belonging, and way, the way we can enhance belonging is encouraging cultures of mutual encouragement. Mutual encouragement where kids are encouraged to say to other kids, well done, that's immediate air in the balloon. They expect it from mum and dad, they expect it from teachers, but if they learn to encourage one another, I'm always talking to schools about encouraging collaboration, working with one another, not constantly in the posture of against one another and competition. We want to see schools 
becoming places of collaboration. So the first is the importance of belonging. The second is the growth mindset. And really two things to say about the growth mindset. The first thing is, as mums, dads, and as teachers, we must have a growth mindset towards our children. Instead of saying, you can't, full stop, close the door, game over, we actually say, you can't do it yet. And we need to have that attitude towards them. It's sometimes easy when you've got a number of children say, oh, no, sport's not your thing, game over. But we mustn't do that. And then they need to have that attitude of, I can't do it yet. Folks, I'm a passionate believer in the growth mindset because it has worked so significantly in my life. I remember when I came out of hospital and I went down to my mother's house where I rehabilitated for six weeks, I couldn't walk. And a day in the life of James Schoen would wake up and it would be a bum shuffle down the stairs. And I'd get to the bottom, I'd get my Zimmer frame and go into my mum's kitchen. And that's where I'd meet Julie, the physiotherapist. And she was there to hold onto my shoulders and help me walk from one side of the kitchen to the other. Well done, she'd say, James, you've done four steps today. Brilliant. I couldn't walk. Yet two or three years later, I rode down the River Thames from start to finish. Now, folks, I really don't say that for my own, well done, James. I say it to say the growth mindset works. And what we must do, what teachers must do, is notice and applaud those small steps. Generation Z, the young people today, often there's an impatience to proceed. They want to get there overnight. But sometimes we just need to know the journey is about small steps. So belonging first. The second is growth mindset. The third is that they are all good at something. A quote that changed my journey as a teacher, as a tutor, is Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory, where he says, don't ask how intelligent is X, but ask how is X intelligent which is to say that every single young person is intelligent in one way or another. Gosh, that's amazing. I remember a pupil I taught. He wasn't academic, if I hold up my balloon. He wasn't sporty. He wasn't artistic, dramatic, or musical. So the five traditional conduits of a school were all shut off to him. And if you imagine a day in the life of this poor fellow, he turns up to English, it's history, it's maths, you know, it's French. Then he goes out for a bit of rugby. He can't do any of it. Then he checks his Instagram account and nobody's following him. And uh, that's the point at which you're beginning to see that it's such a challenge for them. But, you know, this guy was good with people. Would you show some parents around? <laughs> Air goes in his balloon. Would you help mentor some year nine pupils? <laughs> More air goes in his balloon. And when he's got air in his balloon, he's resilient. He's able to bounce back. The maths that he can't do, the French that he's not very good at, the rugby that he's not good at, it's a different story. He's got air in the balloon, and he's resilient. So folks, as well as all being intelligent, they all have a very specific purpose. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing somebody in their place of purpose. Ken Robinson, in his very popular TED Talk, talks about how we all have an element, which is the joining point between what we love doing and what we're naturally good at. And when those two come together, there's almost a charge that is released. It's not eating pizza. It's not playing computer games. But I wonder what it is. For some, it might be high-profile high stuff, the sort of sporting stars or the dramatic stars. But for some, it may be more hidden. And that's where I think there's real power in parents observing, noticing, watching. As well as, these are the conversations to be having around the dinner table. Not necessarily how's their physics homework, or, but actually, where are they intelligent? What is their purpose? So they're all good at something, which moves me on to the final pillar. And the final pillar is this is that they, we want to encourage them to dream dreams, to have a hope, to have a security that they feel that they can fit into this world. And here, I spend quite a lot of time mentoring young people now. 
And often one of the things that is really holding people back is that a setback, I don't like the word failure, but a setback or a failure is resting over somebody like a shroud. And they are defining themselves by it. So Mike goes, oh, I'm blind. But actually what I always encourage is instead of defining ourselves by it, we hold it out in front of us and we ask ourselves, what can I learn from it? We reflect and we refine on our set from our setbacks. And when we've done that, it's like an arrow that we put into our quiver rather than an arrow that has gone through our hearts. And then we move forward and we ask them that final question. What would you one day love to do? And when somebody is able to say, I would love to, this is what I'm passionate about. That is the place where I see their balloons in a place of almost constant inflation of I can and I am. Thank you for listening.